when, when I was a kid, um, just for fun, I liked writing. You know, I liked making up stories. And I, I wrote a lot of stories when I was first writing about the kids in my neighborhood. I, I lived in a place called Burnt Hills, New York, which is out in the country. And, uh, but somehow we were battling the Capone gang because my favorite TV show was The Untouchables. And I don't know what, what the Capone gang was doing in Burnt Hills, New York, but um, the kids in my neighborhood were fighting them. Um, so I think like a lot of writers, a lot of what I wrote when I was first starting was based on other people's work, you know, and, and, and I was, I, I, I really um, understood style pretty young. I remember um, the first time it just popped with, with you know, uh, technique that I probably was about 10 years old and I was reading a book called The Black Stallion, which later got made into a very nice movie. Um, and in the Black Stallion, there's, you know, it's mostly told in a, in a kind of close, omniscient form. And it's this kid and this beautiful Black Stallion that he somehow adopts and gets back to America. And, you know, it, it turns out to be a great running horse and all this stuff. And so it's really like a, a nice kid's thing. And uh, somebody notices the horse is really fast and they get him on a racetrack and everything. And um, it's all leading to this last chapter where somehow the Black Stallion is going to be, who's never been in an official race before, is going to be at a real racetrack racing the two greatest, you know, race horses, thoroughbreds of its time. A three horse race to see who's the fastest horse in the world. And you're all ready to be there with a the kid and the horse and everything. And I think the guy's name was James Farley, the, the author, starts the chapter and he starts it and he's talking about an 80 year old guy who's a race handicapper. And it starts with something he'd always wanted to handicap the perfect race. It's like, what are we talking about this guy for? You know, when's the race going to start? You know? and, and, and I just, you know, I was so curious about this. Thing. What's he doing this? And then what happens is that through this 80 year old guy's eyes, we see the race, but a little bit of distance. But we're so into the book and the flow of the book that it's a way for him to, to back us off a little bit, but but keep us in it and make us work with it. So we're so it's not so sentimental that it's it's of course this is going to happen. Um, and at the end, you get tied up and is the guy going to win? And have them all go nose to nose to nose to nose. And the last line is something like, if he'd only added a. Uh, an eighth of a pound to the black stallion, and you realize the black stallion won by a nose because he, he didn't he, he was carrying as much weight as was the uh, So you know, and it's just like, oh wow, these words are here for a reason. You know, this guy picked these things. He didn't just tell the story because he knew the story. Right. Not right. only did right. he, the story. yeah, he he not only made it up, but he told it in a certain way. You know, and, and from that point on, I was interested in, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you create these effects for the reader? Mm -hmm. Which was usually only me, let's just say. Although, um, it was always nice when uh, writing was part of your grade, because I could just hand in poundage <laughs> and stuff, and, um, you know, get my grade point out. Like, yeah. like, like that, like, you know, um, that would get me up to at least a B from my other students. <laughs> But, but a lot of times it was just for the fun of it, to just tell the story and see if I could make it. And I think the other lucky thing for me is that um, some quirk of short-term memory, within a day or two, I forget what I have written. So if I put it aside for a couple days and I read it again, it's like somebody else wrote it. And so I, it, I started to rewrite. Oh, that's not so good. Change that. So, so rewrite. I mean, rewriting is something that it takes a little. Some people it takes a long time for them to understand and actually do. That is necessary. Yeah. And, right. and, yeah, yeah. And you spend a lot of time rewriting other people's. Yeah, and 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 there, you know, uh, you know, I make a living as a screenwriter for hire, or sometimes I make a living as a screenwriter for hire, and very often you're brought in when a screenplay has already been written. Sometimes it's based on a novel or a short story or a newspaper article or a documentary that's been shot. And a lot of what your mandate is, is to talk to the people who are gonna pay you and who wanna make a movie and say, so what do you like about this product? Where do you want it to go? And then find what's useful in what's already there. Once or twice I've actually said to them, you know what, 
I don't know what I can do. I think you should shoot this. It hasn't happened very often in 30 years or some more than 30 years. But everyone's long said, I don't understand why you haven't shot this yet. Because this is really good. Uh, more often it's, okay, I can see this is what it is and this is where you want to go and this isn't there yet. Right. So, right. so you get that mandate. Um, so, so it's very technical in a way. Um, but once you once you kind of figure out the technical way that you're going to change it, the structural way you're going to change it, then the characters just have to live, you know. And sometimes the dialogue isn't very good, and you make that better. Or sometimes you have to invent a new character or get rid of some characters or whatever. But a lot of it is really just structural, mm -hmm. um, and and that's something that over the years you learn with with movies that you know movies are very very different than fiction. Uh, this is a book. Uh, a woman in the sun that has takes place over about six years. There's at least 30 characters in there who have at least one chapter in their point of view and in their voice. Um, in a movie, uh, if you've got three different points of view running, that's a lot for an audience to deal with. And then the other thing is, nobody's, I hope, going to sit down and read that in one sitting. Um, you know, maybe for the Guinness Book of Records or something like that. But um, the way movies uh, evolved was the idea of when you sat down and you watched it. Now, a lot of people don't do that anymore. They multitask or they watch a little and then they pause their computer and go do something else and come back and watch some more. But generally, movies were meant to release information, whether it's emotional information or plot information, in a rhythm in a, in a set period of time. So you have a, you know, a whole nother, it's like three dimensions rather than two. Um, and so structure becomes even more important in some ways than it is for fiction. This is a book that you can wander around in. You can even skip a couple chapters and read a chapter, and the chapter itself will make some sense. Right. I don't recommend that, but you know. Right. Um, but in a movie, you really don't, you, you get pretty upset if they mix the real something, which has happened to us. Um, it doesn't make sense anymore, you know. And, and not only doesn't it make plot sense, it doesn't make emotional rhythmic sense. Um, so, so much of the rewriting that I do is about that structure. How is the how is the the information going to be released and when? Right. And how do you build things up and then ease them off and then build them up again? And so the rewrite.